This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. We love him and we honor him and we give him glory. Well, if you would turn your attention with me to the 12th chapter of the book of Acts, verse 5 through 10. Notice there in the, in the NIV version of Scripture. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. And then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. And Peter followed, Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. And they passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. And then they had walked, when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. I'm talking today simply from the subject, the great escape. The great escape, the great escape. No matter what you might be in, God is able to help you to get out of it. No matter how deep the situation is, how deep the hole is, you can get out of it. You really can. This was at a time when this was actually uh, King Herod, actually Agrippa I. He was harassing some of the members of the church. And uh, he actually, uh, at this particular time, you know, there was once when they would put people to death at this particular time in their history in that part of the world, that they would actually take an ax and behead people. Well, this time, you know, in this period, they were using a sword to behead him. And they beheaded James, the brother of John, and cut his head off with a sword. And when the king, when King Herod saw that it pleased the Jews to kill James, the brother of John, he immediately went after Peter and arrested Peter. And the only reason that Peter is in prison right now in maximum security is because it is the time of the Passover. And so they didn't want to kill during that time, so they've got him in jail waiting to be put to death. And here is Peter now in jail waiting to, to be put to death. And he's in what, would be, what we would consider to be a humanly impossible situation of escape. Remember, he's in maximum security. Uh, not only is he in jail, he is chained. Both of his wrists are chained to soldiers who are assigned to guard him, maximum security. And then there are two other guards at the door. So even in case he's able to break out, you've got two other guards to try to get through. And yet God does a Houdini trick and gets him out of a humanly impossible situation and gets them out of the prison. Now, you might wonder why in the world this, this king wastes his time to go after religious people, after Christians who are on fire for Jesus. Here's what I would say to you, is that whenever there is an attack against you, it's because there is an assignment within you. Whenever there is an attack against you, it's because there's an assignment within you. Whenever there's an attack against you, it's because there's an assignment within you. It's because there's an anointing within you. If you carry an assignment, and if you got an anointing for that assignment, I'm telling you, the devil is coming after you with both barrels of his shotgun. He's coming after you. He's coming after you. That if there is 
and attack against you, it is really only because there is an assignment within you. There's an assignment that you carry. There's an anointing that you carry. There's a purpose that you carry. The devil doesn't waste his time attacking people that are no threat to his kingdom. But if you ever come into a position to where you are threatening the kingdoms uh, that, that he rules, money kingdoms, the marketplace, entertainment. If you start making an impact, he's coming after you. If you start shifting people toward godliness, toward God Christ-like character, the devil is coming after you. So if you don't want any attacks, don't do anything. But if you're going to do anything that is worth doing, get ready for the attack. And you got to realize I'm anointed for this. God has prepared me. Bring it on, devil. I've been anointed for this. I've got blood on me for this. And so bring it on, devil. I've, I'm built for this. I'm built. Bring it on. Bring it on. Bring it on. And remember now, this is the same Peter. I call him impetuous Peter. He, he had a, he, Peter was hot-headed. He had a temper. He'd snap on you in a minute. I mean, he was one of those kind of Christians, and we see them, we, we all know them. The kind that if you mess with them, I meant they, they know how to reach back to when they were in the world. They still know the vocabulary. This is the way Peter is. Peter's like, you, you, you come back, I got some hood in me. Peter was ratchet. <laughs> He, he, he had a little thug in him. He's like, put your hands on him if you want. And remember when he was defending Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and they, they, they put their hands on him? Peter pulled his sword out and cut that man's ear off. And the only reason that he cut his ear off is because he was going for the man's head and he ducked. <laughs> Peter, Peter was a bad boy. And uh, he's, an, he's an impetuous man that would just jump out. You know, Jesus was saying one time, he says, where I'm going, he says, you know, Peter said, we, we don't know where you're going. I mean, all of the other disciples were quiet, but Peter spoke up. This is the same Peter who on the day of Pentecost got up and preached and 3,000 souls were added to the church. Peter is a businessman. He owns a fishing industry. And, and, and even when Jesus had been killed and taken away, when, remember when Jesus came back? Peter was back at his boat. They were out there washing their nets because he still ran the fishing industry. And so he's a businessman being used of God by vocational. And he's being used of God in a powerful way. That's why there were demonic attacks against him. Because Peter was converting people left and right. Not only was he a fisher of fish, he was a fisher of men. It wasn't either or, it was both and. And so that's what he was doing. And so Peter's life now is in process. Peter's life is in process. There is no real progress without process. And God will put your life in process. Peter is in process. Faith that is not tested cannot be trusted. Let me say that again. Faith that is not tested cannot be trusted. Peter is in process. He's still being tested, and the process will both test you and teach you. Let me say that again. The process will both test you and teach you. The process, it'll test you, and the process will teach you. And so here now, these guards, I would have hated to be one of those guards who had to be chained all night to a human being. One on one side and the other on the other. Both of his wrists are chained and they are chained to the arms of two soldiers who are assigned to guard him because he's in maximum security prison. And here with little hope, human hope of escaping, there are many folks that may be here today, there are some that are watching, that are, that are streaming today, and you may not be in a physical prison but you're in a prison of depression. You're locked in a prison of anxiety. Some of you are stuck in a prison of grief. You're stuck in a prison of unforgiveness. Some of you are stuck in a prison of some kind of addiction, be it a chemical addiction, be it a sexual addiction, uh, to pornography, whatever it is. You're, you're, you're trapped, 
locked in a prison of it and it has spun its webs and, and it's become like cables in your life and you're tied down. Some of you are locked in a prison of shame. Some are locked in a, in a prison of, of, of poverty kinds of, of thinking. Uh, as some of you are locked in a prison of low self-esteem and just personal self-loathing and rejection. You're locked in a prison. It's not a physical prison, but it's got your life on lockdown. And I, I just came to remind you here that God sent an angel into the maximum security prison to be able to get Peter free. And, and, and God trusts me as the angel of this house. He sent an angel to you today. It's not because I'm perfect. I, I'm, I'm, the word angel, angelos, it means messenger, messenger, messenger. Who is the angel? Maybe the messenger that God wanted to send into your life. To send into your world with a message to be able to turn the light on and wake you up and get you out of the prison. The prison of fear. Just scared to go anywhere. Scared to do anything. Break out of the prison because it's time now for you to have your coming out party. It really is. I encourage you today, don't accept that you're stuck. Don't accept that you're stuck. There is a way out. So don't accept that you are stuck. There is always a way out. Don't let people get you stuck into where they first met you, assuming that you are that same person, that you've not had any growth, that you've not had any development. I'm not the same person that I was 25 years ago. I'm not the same. Don't, don't respond to me as though I'm the person that you knew 30 years ago. I'm a growing, evolving person. Don't let people lock you into an earlier season of your life, limiting their expectations of you because of what you couldn't do back then. You've grown now. Your exposure has been different now. You've gone through process. You've processed failure. You've dealt with hurt. And you've still been able to be resilient, to bounce back. And that has made you a different person. You're not the same person that used to cry every time somebody would criticize you and say something negative against you, talking about you. You've grown now. You are not the same person. Don't get locked into an epoch of your life to where you cannot be who God has called you to be. We are called to become. We are a work in progress, but we are not where we used to be. You know, at one point, you remember Joseph, the son of, of Jacob, the favored son? Here at one place in life, here he is with his coat of many colors. He's swagging out, got his beautiful garment on, coat of many colors, showing that he is highly favored and blessed of God, that he's loved by his father, and he's got the coat of favor on. But listen, let me remind you of this. Favor doesn't mean that you won't have to fight. You can be favored, but you've got to fight. You can be favored, but you'll go through hell and high water sometimes. You can be favored and you'll still be deceived sometimes. You can be favored and people will still betray you. You can have the favor of God on your life and be falsely accused and falsely imprisoned and have your freedom stripped away from you and yet you're still favored. This was Joseph. Can you imagine at the time that his own brothers, his blood brothers, put him in a pit? Can you imagine had he stayed in that pit, what would have happened to him? But here he's in, he's in his own little prison in a pit put there by people that were his family. And sometimes people are locked into a place because their own family cannot see who they are. And it's amazing how sometimes your own relatives cannot see the gift of God that you are and yet people that have no blood connection to you at all can see that you are God's anointed. They can see God's gift in you. They can see God's anointing in you, God's favor upon you, God's creativity working in you. But he didn't allow himself to stay in that pit. God touched the oldest boy, Reuben, and said, hey, we can't do this. Hey, if, if we kill him, we don't get anything. At least let's sell him and then sold him into slavery. Can you imagine had he remained stuck as a slave? That's how he wound up serving as a servant in Potiphar's house. Can you imagine had he gotten stuck as a slave, but God was his liberator? You see, he was still favored, but he was on lockdown, on lockdown, but still 
favored by God. And remember then Potiphar's wife lied on him and he was sent to prison? Still favored. And he didn't let a, a, a prison stint on his record interfere with his destiny. You know why? Because he didn't stay in prison. He didn't stay in prison. And remember the baker and the butler who were there? They got out first. You know why? Because the bigger that your destiny is, the longer that it takes for you to get out. You see, the, the, the baker and the butler, we don't really hear about their stories too much after they got out. But we all hear about Joseph because he was destined for something that was bigger than the prison. Don't let people get you stuck when you were in a pit or stuck when you were in prison because he was destined for the palace. He was destined for the palace. He was destined for the palace. Don't get stuck at a place where you are not destined. Don't get stuck. Peter was not destined for this maximum security prison, so God got him out. God got him out. So don't accept that you got to stay stuck somewhere. Don't accept that you have to stay stuck. There's a great escape that God has. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus encounters a Jewish woman who is a daughter of Abraham. And, and she's been in this condition now for 18 years. Can you imagine? She was, the Bible says she was bent over and could no wise lift herself up. She's been over for 18 years. Now, any time that you've been in a position for 18 years, and, and, and I'm sure she was praying, and she was asking God to touch her and to fix it. And, and can you imagine suffering with an issue for 18 years and is still not fixed? She seemed like she was stuck. But after 18 years, it's never too late. It's never too late. She had an encounter with Jesus. And Jesus came as an angel and just delivered a message to her. And the message that Jesus delivered to her in Luke chapter 13 was simply this message, Woman, thou art loosed. You are loosed from your infirmity. He just came with a message to wake her up, to slap her with truth, to say, you've been bent over, but sweetheart, you are loosed. Not God is going to do it. You are loosed from your infirmity. He just announced to her as a messenger that she was loosed. And all of a sudden, in the same way that the bands that were on Peter's arms fell off and he was loosed because a messenger showed up. When Jesus showed up with a message, immediately this woman that had been bent over for 18 years immediately stood straight for the first time in 18 years. How long have you been suffering with what you've been asking God to do? And so you assume that after two or three years, well, I guess I'll have to just live with this. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. God can, in, in a moment of time, God can flip your situation. Some of you have been struggling with unemployment, where you've been unemployed or underemployed. God can change your destiny overnight. I meant just with one message, just with one revelation from God. It can change your life by one person that God sends into your world. Your whole fate can change overnight, overnight, overnight. So no matter how long you've been stuck, or bound by something, you don't have to stay stuck. And then I know people that have just been bound by all kinds of lustful thoughts and, and temptations that are persistent in their life that will never stop. But there is hope. There is hope. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Notice, the temptation in your life, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful, and God is faithful, and God is faithful, and God is faithful. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptations to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. He will show you a way out so that you can endure. God is faithful. 
God is faithful. He will show you a way out. He'll make a way of escape. God will show you a way out. He showed Peter a way out of maximum security where there was no human hope of his getting out. God showed him a way out. And if you're bound by something, I want to remind you of this, that you need praying people in your corner. Look at Acts chapter 12 and verse 5 here. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. You need praying folks in your corner. It says that he was earnestly praying. The church was earnestly praying. Other versions say it this way, that the church was constantly praying for him. Constantly praying for him. The church was praying without ceasing for Peter. They were praying for him. They were praying for him. And I, I just want you to realize that when the church begins praying earnestly and constantly, no one can keep you bound for long. Nobody can keep you bound for long. Look at verse 6, Acts 12, 6. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries. These guards stood guard at the entrance. Here's what I want you to see here. That though Peter's body was bound, his spirit was not bound. Though his body was bound, his spirit was not bound. Do you see that this is the night before his trial? He's on death center. He's on death row. Peter is sleeping. He's sleeping. He's sleeping. And his life is on the line. Peter is sleeping. Though his body was bound, his spirit was not bound. He was able to rest. He slept. He's in a life and death situation. But see, when you're in a life and death situation, your mind has to be totally on the Lord. I mean totally on the Lord. The, the Bible reminds us in Romans chapter 8, verse 6, that to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. He's in jail and he could lose everything that he's got. His life is on the line and Peter is asleep in between two grown men to whom he is chained and he is asleep. I started to entitle this message Off the Chain. <laughs> I meant because he was chained and the chains fell off when the angel came there and announced his message. But here's what I want you to see. That sometimes God can use your chain situation for your own benefit. Now what, what you might think is a handicap, God can uh, take that weakness and let strength come out of what looked like a weakness. Are you listening? Uh, in, in, in Mark chapter 5, we find the story uh, of, of this woman with the issue of blood for, for 12 years. Again, here she, she's been suffering for 12 long years. 12 years, not 12 days, not 12 months, 12 years, wondering, uh, you know, God, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm bleeding. I've got an issue of blood. I've got a discharge that's constantly flowing out of me, Jesus. I, I need to be healed. I've, I've, I've got a problem. Jesus touched me for 12 years. And the Bible says she, she had taken responsibility for her own life. How do we know that? Because the Bible says she has spent everything that she had going to doctors. And she was not any better, but rather grew worse. But she did what she could. She operated and did what she could. But then the Bible says that she came in the press behind. I like this lady because though she had been bound for 12 years with a bloody issue, uh, she, was, she was messed up. This, this woman had, was struggling with trying to fit in. Because she had been living a defiled life for these 12 years. But you know, I'm so grateful uh, to the Lord that this woman didn't stay stuck in something that had her bound. In Leviticus chapter 15 and verse 19, uh, the, the Bible talks there about if, if, if a woman has a discharge of her blood, an issue of her blood, that she is defiled for seven days. And if anybody touches her, Anybody touches the woman, they'd be defiled until the evening. And, and so in, in my mind's eye, you know, initially I, I thought about the fact that when this woman came, heard of Jesus, and she came in, in, into, the, into the presence of Jesus and, and said, if I may but touch his clothes, I'll be made whole. But the Bible says there was a crowd that was around him that was thronging him. How did this woman that had a handicap 
of this bloody issue that defiled her as a person. How did she get to Jesus? I, I'm here to tell you she used her handicap. She realized Leviticus 15. And so all she had to do was cry, unclean. When homegirl said, unclean, it's like somebody coughing real bad and sneezing during a pandemic. Homegirl said, unclean, unclean. But she was still coming, unclean, unclean. And the path, it put her to the front of the line. Are you listening to me? Homegirl took what was a disadvantage and she used it for her advantage to get her in a front row audience perspective with Jesus Christ because she cried unclean, unclean. And, and she didn't have to press and push people out of the way when people heard unclean. It was like the Red Sea parted. They made a way for her because she said unclean. She used her disadvantage to her advantage and got her to the front of the line. When are you going to begin to use your disadvantage to an advantage and get you into a front row position with Jesus and said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. My point is, is that you don't have to stay stuck. Use your disadvantage to an advantage. Find it. Find it. There's an advantage in every disadvantage. Find it. There's an advantage in every disadvantage. Find it. Find it. There's an advantage in every disadvantage. Your disadvantage makes you unique. There's an advantage in every disadvantage. Use it. Don't apologize for being a woman. Use it. Don't apologize for being young. Use it. Don't apologize for being old. Use it. Find the advantage in your disadvantage. It'll get you to the front of the line. Notice verse 7, Acts 12, 7. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. And Peter, uh, he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. They just fell off. They fell off. God sent an angel, a messenger. Notice that when the angel appeared, I want you to notice this. A light shone in the cell. 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 I don't know about you, but I, I'm, uh, I'm not one of those heavy sleepers. If somebody turns on a light, the light wakes me up. But the light didn't wake Peter up. But when the angel came, a light shone in the cell. Uh, not long ago, I went and did a, one of these isolation tanks, and they put you in darkness and sound deprivation and all of that. And so at the end of my time, the way that I knew that my time was up is because while I had fallen asleep in the tank, a light came on. A light, and the light woke me up. It's amazing. I can't tell you how uh, the light has an ability to wake you up, but when you're sensitive to God, God can just send light to you and wake you up. But Peter was hard-headed. Peter was one you couldn't just wake up with light by just telling them the truth. You think that you tell some people the truth and you wake them up? <laughs> Good luck. You can tell some people exactly what's going to happen and they still bring light, the light of understanding, and they still won't obey. Anybody know anybody like that? Keep looking straight ahead, look straight ahead. And you can turn on light for people and they still won't straighten up. And here's the thing that I want you to realize is that when the light of God doesn't awaken you, prepare yourself to be slapped. Because an angel had to slap him to wake him up. He had, pow, Peter, get up. You think that this was just a spirit? No, this angel slapped Peter upside his head. And said, get up. He slapped him. The light turned on. He didn't wake up. But I bet he woke up when he got the slap. It struck him on the side and woke him up. The angel, pow, Peter, it's time to get up. He woke up then. And there are some people that didn't respond to the light. You better get ready. Brace yourself for a slap. Because if God sent his word and gave you prophetic warning, 
He's getting ready to slap you with an experience. He's getting ready to slap you with a lawsuit. He's getting ready to slap you with tax trouble. He's getting ready to slap you with your children who act like they lose their mind. He's getting ready to slap you, I'm telling you, with a jarring uh, medical diagnosis. God will slap you with something that will wake you up. It, it, sometimes the slap has to be the death of, of a loved one. It has to be your job being lost or, or benefits being cut back or cut off. Sometimes it's a severe accident. Sometimes it is a trauma. You don't know what God will use to slap you, to wake you up, to get you out of something that you're stuck in. But he will slap you. I'm here to tell you, God will slap you in love, in Jesus' name. <laughs> he will. And here's what I want you to understand. God is not trying to hurt us. He's trying to wake us. God's not trying to hurt us. He's trying to wake us. God is not trying to hurt us. He's trying to wake us. He's trying to wake us up. He's just trying to wake us up. And I'm just telling you, too much of the global church is asleep. Too much of our influence has been locked up. Too much of our authority has been locked up. Too much of our anointing has been locked up. Too much of our creativity has been locked up. Too much of our Christian witness has been locked up. It's our time to come out now. It's time to wake up even though it's still night. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. May, may I say this to you? Getting up is half the battle. Just getting up is half the battle. Some people, when they, they, they wake up in the morning, it's just hard for them to get out of the bed. It's just hard to get out of the bed. Just getting up is half the battle, half the battle, half the battle, half the battle to just get up. What do you need to get up from so that you can get out? Because you can't get out until you get up. You got to wake up, get up, and then get out. Wake up, get up, and get out. But getting up is half the battle. And I want you to understand this principle. Morning is not determined by a certain hour of the day. Morning comes when God's light shines to you. God's light can shine to you in the middle of the night. Understand that when the angel came into Peter's jail cell, it's in the middle of the night. It's the middle of the night. It's not morning yet. But when he came, light came, and it was morning time for Peter. And may I tell you that even if you're in a dark season in your life, the Bible teaches us that we have the capacity with our praise to summon the morning. Did you know that? Look at Psalm 108 and verse 2. Wake up, lyre and harp. These are musical instruments. I will wake the dawn with my song. I will wake the dawn. The dawn is the morning. I will wake up the morning with my song. I don't wait for the morning to wake me up. I will take a, a midnight praise, praise while it's dark outside, and use my song to awaken the dawn. So if you're in a dark period, sing. Sing. You're going through trouble, sing. Don't you ever let anything rob you of your song. Keep on singing. Don't let anything rob you of your praise. Keep singing. You got trouble in your marriage, trouble on your job, trouble in your neighborhood, trouble in your own bodies, in your health. Keep on singing praises unto God. Keep singing praises unto God. God is faithful. Be faithful to Him. God is faithful. He's still worthy to be praised even while you're going through trouble. God, he's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy to be praised. Keep singing praise. Your praise, your song will waken and summon the dawn. It'll summon the dawn. God will send light into you. And so even if the sun has not yet risen, you can summon the dawn with your song and with your praise. But this angel had to slap Peter to wake him up. But may I say this to you? It is better to have an enemy to slap you in the face than a friend to stab you in the back. It really is. People uh, can do you a, a tremendous favor just by, by slapping you to wake you up. Because if somebody doesn't slap you to wake you up, you're getting ready to, to go across a bridge where the bridge is out. And somebody is trying to slap you to awaken you to say, hey, listen, you're on a dangerous road. You're very fragile right now. You can't afford to keep going this way. It's, it's, it's difficult. This is, this is difficult. This reminds me of an instance back in October the 19th of 1960. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., right here in the city of Atlanta, went to downtown Riches. 
Went to Rich's right in downtown Atlanta. Sat down in the restaurant waiting to be served. And he knew that was against the law. He's practicing civil disobedience. Respectful, honorable, quiet, civil disobedience. And they call the cops and they, they, they arrest him. And they put Dr. King in October the 19th of 1960 in prison and they, they sent him down to Reedsville. They wouldn't even allow him, his family, to post bond. They just sent him to Reedsville. And their plan was to have him to serve for four months of hard labor on the chain gang. This is October the 19th, 1960. And, and he had a pregnant wife at home, Coretta. She was pregnant with their third child during this time. And I don't know whether you realize this, but sometimes, you know, pregnant women don't have high tolerance levels. And she was afraid that they're taking her husband down to Reedsville, that he would be severely beaten or even lynched. And she's pregnant with that third child, and she needs her husband. And homegirl got on the telephone because it's campaign time for an election between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. And homegirl picked up the telephone, and she called Richard Nixon. And she said, my husband has been arrested. You need to do something. Because whether you realize this or not, Martin Luther King was a confidant for Richard Nixon. When Nixon was serving under Eisenhower, he helped him craft legislation for civil rights. And so he had been a friend. They had talked many times. And Martin Luther King planned on voting for Richard Nixon, a Republican. But when he's in prison and his pregnant wife with that third child makes the call to Nixon, Nixon was afraid that if he helped King, that he would lose the South. And so she called John F. Kennedy's camp and said, they've arrested my husband. I'm pregnant. Her baby was born that next January. She's pregnant in October of 1960. And she's like, I need my husband. She's the angel getting her husband out of prison. And John F. Kennedy, after she called their campaign headquarters, John F. Kennedy called Coretta. And he picked up the phone and had his brother Robert to call the governor of Georgia and one of the judges to begin to negotiate his release. And they got him out. And when he got out, when he got out, he had some words to say to Nixon, his friend. He called him a moral coward because the only reason that he wouldn't step in to help is because of a fear of what he was losing. And it takes courage to do the right thing. And he lacked it. And then he gave his support to John F. Kennedy. You may not realize this, but John F. Kennedy won that election by 35,000 key votes that was swung by the influence of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's amazing, but he got out. It's amazing what God will use and if he has to use a pregnant wife to get you out. <laughs> he knows exactly what is necessary to be able to bring you out of a bad situation. But I'm just telling you, it looked impossible. But when you're desperate, desperate people do desperate things. And it worked. And she got him out. But here this angel of the Lord steps into Peter's cell to awaken him. And the angel basically gave Peter three commands. Get up, get dressed, and get out. Follow me. Get up, get dressed, and get out. What is it that you have been stewing in? Well, long enough you've been grieving over now. You've been nursing a wound that you won't let heal. 
long enough now. You've been worried about it long enough. You've been pry crying and praying over this issue. Now long enough. Listen, listen. It's time to get up, get dressed, and get out. It's the message of the angel. The angel came with a message. The angel didn't have paragraphs. He gave him some really short sentences. Get up, put your clothes on, get dressed, and get out. Follow me. I'm going to walk you out of this situation. The angel of the Lord put Peter on the move. And listen, I can't explain this to you, but the only thing that I can tell you is that when we submit ourselves to just putting our feet in a direction to start moving, that God will cause the whole universe to conspire to get behind you and to start working. You may not know how it's going to work out and where the help is going to come from, but if you just put yourself in motion to just start going somewhere. The angel just said, follow me, follow me. And as soon as he got Peter on the move and, and walked him about a mile down the road, the angel vanishes because he said, I've done my job. I just needed to get you out. You know how to take it over from here. I just came to get you out of the bad situation. Once I get you out, you'll know what to do. But if you just put yourself in motion, success is always connected to motion. Success is always connected to motion. You got to get unstuck. Some of you have been stuck in your emotions. You've been stuck in your mindset. You've been stuck in the good old days when things worked back then. This is a new time. And what worked then, what got you there won't get you here. It's time now to get unstuck and start moving in a different direction. You got to move. You got to move. You got to bust a move. Frederick Douglass, the runaway slave, said these words. He said, I prayed for 20 years but received no answer until I prayed with my legs. And homeboy took off running. He ran his way to freedom. He ran his way. He said, I prayed for 20, 20 years. And then he said, I didn't get an answer until I prayed with my legs. And there's some of you that have been sitting there waiting for something to fall to you like ripe cherries off of a tree. It's time for you to pray with your legs. You got to start running after what God has for you. You got to get yourself in motion and start stepping up to the plate. Stepping up to responsibility. Stepping up to owning it. Stepping up to praying. Stepping up to believing. Stepping up to even serving while you're still hurting. It's amazing. It's amazing. Many people, they don't even realize sometimes that a curse is simply something that keeps you in the place where you are. It's a prison. It's a prison. There's so many people that when they experience trauma, they get locked in the prison of the time in which the trauma happened and they can't seem to get beyond it. The car accident. They can't get beyond the death. They can't get beyond the rape or the molestation. They can't get beyond it. They're locked until a messenger comes. It says, get up, get dressed, get out. There's an old Chinese proverb that says that a man grows tired by standing still. A man grows tired by standing still. It's time to bust a move. It's time to bust a move. And listen, though your, your situation that you're dealing with may be difficult, is not impossible. Though your situation may be difficult, it is not impossible. You feel that I'm stuck and I don't know what to do to even get out of here? Just put yourself in motion. Start working on some stuff. Get your computer out and start Googling some possibilities. Start reaching out for some contacts. Start putting yourself in motion. Start drawing up some plans. Just put yourself in motion. He's just trying to wake you up, get you dressed, and get you out of that stuck place. And I know that his deliverance is sometimes so miraculous. It was so miraculous to Peter. Peter thought he was dreaming. He thought he was seeing a vision. And he's actually physically walked out of the prison, maximum security that the angel obviously had put them in a deep sleep and he got them free from the two folks that he was chained, walked by the two sentries that were guarding the door. And when they got to the door, the doors just opened. And I'm telling you, it's not until you put yourself in motion. The Bible says the doors open on their own. They open on their own. When you'll just obey God, God will cause doors and relationships to start opening. 
opening on their own, opening on their own, opening on their own. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but listen, when you put yourself in motion, God will call some doors of opportunity, some doors of blessings, some doors that will establish you in your destiny to begin to open on their own. All you have to do is obey God. You put one foot in front of the other. You start doing what God told you to do, and God will put you before the right people. Doors will open. Doors that had been closed to you, the doors will open on their own in the name of Jesus. I declare open doors to you today. I declare open doors coming into your life today from things that have had you bound. Open doors, open doors, open doors, open doors for new business, open doors of new opportunity, open doors of new sales and commissions coming your way, open doors of new business, new clients. I'm telling you, new visions and new destinies, new partnership. Open doors, 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 open doors. I declare it in the name of Jesus. I decree it in the name of Jesus. I just came as a messenger today to let you know he said, wake up, wake up, wake up, get your clothes on. You're going somewhere. You're coming out. You're coming out of your depression. You're coming out of your poverty. You're coming out of your sickness. You're coming out of your dysfunction. You are coming out. This is a new day. This is a new season. It's your time. It's your time. It's your time. I heard the word of the Lord down in my spirit. In John chapter 11 and verse 40, here's what the Lord is saying right now. Did not I say to you that if you would believe that you would see the glory of God, if you will believe, you will see the glory of God. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. If you believe, if you believe. Jesus said this when Martha's sister, Martha's brother Lazarus was dead. And he's still in the grave. And he says to her, didn't I tell you? You thought that you were locked in an irreversible situation. You didn't think you, you could be helped. You thought that this was beyond help. But he says, didn't I tell you that if you believe, if you believe that you would see the glory of God, that you would see the glory of God. I hear a cry in my spirit now saying, Lord, send your glory. Send your glory. Send your glory. Send your glory. As God delivers by the power of the Holy Ghost, the glory of God will begin to heal your marriage. The glory of God will begin to heal your body. My God, glory is the atmosphere for miracles. Glory is the atmosphere for miracles. Glory is the atmosphere for miracles. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. God will deal with your son. God will deal with your daughter. God, in the name of Jesus, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. You'll see the glory of God in your business if you believe, 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 you will see the glory of God if you believe. It might look like it's dead. It might look like it's over. You tried everything that you know. It looks like it's, it's finished. But if you believe, you will see the glory. You'll see the glory. You'll see the glory. Everything happens for our good and for His glory. For our good and for His glory. God's going to get glory out of all the hell that you've been through. Hey, yes, He will. Yes, He will. Yes, He will. You've not suffered in vain. God will use it for His glory. He'll use suffering for His glory. He will use the cutoff for His glory. He will use the isolation for his glory. God is going to use it for his glory. The glory, the glory, the glory, the glory. I declare to you in the name of Jesus. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. If you believe, you will see the glory. You'll see the glory. You'll see the glory. There's glory. Don't leave your story until you discover the glory. Your story is not finished until you see the glory of God. 
It's not going to end like it looks like it. <laughs> There's glory in it. If you believe, Shekribas Kotomas, you will see the glory of God. God's got a glory. He's got a glory. He's got a glory. He's going to be glorified. In the midst of everything that you're dealing with, God will be glorified. God will be glorified. God will be glorified. When you got down to nothing, when you were living and existing on fumes, but yet you didn't die. And he didn't leave you to die in a prison. He sent an angel, a messenger, just to say, don't you spend another day in your depression. Not another day in your anxiety disorder. Not another day in your grief and your mourning. Not another day, not another day, not a day in your despair. It's time for you to come out now. It's for the glory of you believe. If you believe, if you believe, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. For your glory, Lord. For your glory, Lord. For your glory, Lord. For your glory, for your glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the wonderful good things that he has done and what he is doing. And the greater part of what God is going to do is for the glory of God. It's for his glory. It's for his glory. It is for his glory. It's for his glory. It is for his glory. God will be glorified. God will be glorified for his glory, for his glory, for his glory, for his glory. The greater the darkness, the greater the glory. The deeper the hole that you've been in, the greater the glory. The lonelier the journey, the greater the glory. The more intense the pain, the greater the glory. The stronger the sickness, the greater the glory. Because he came to bring you out. And he's a healer. It's come to heal the brokenhearted. Those that have been suffering. Jesus came, he died for the brokenhearted. Whatever broke your heart, Jesus is concerned about it. He sees everybody that you've been weeping over. Everybody that you've been praying for. And many of you are like the church outside, but you know who your Peter is that you're praying for that God would deliver. And I'm just telling you that God is in a season now where he will show his miraculous strong arm and God is going to deliver your Peters. He's going to deliver your Peters. He's going to deliver your sons and your daughters. God is going to deliver them out of the prison of where they've been out of their minds acting like somebody that you don't even recognize in the name of Jesus. I declare to you by the power of the Holy Ghost today that if you believe, if you believe, if you believe, I've been infused with the faith to be able to believe God. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it looks like. It's not going to end the way that it is now. God is going to get the glory. He'll get the glory. He'll get the glory. And we know, and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and who are the call according to his purpose. All that I can tell you is that Jesus came to be able to set the captives free. That everything that has burdened your soul, I'm glad that I still believe in the power and the efficacy of the blood of Jesus Christ, the power of the anointing of the Holy Ghost that still breaks yokes and undoes the burden that have rested upon the necks of people for so many years that today, 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 as you walk out of this place, as you walk out of your home, as you walk out of wherever your place of listening is, that you realize that you're not really just walking out of something, you're walking into something. You're walking into another dimension of your destiny. You've been stuck for a while. God came to get you unstuck today. He came to get you unstuck. 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 Unstuck from the memory. Unstuck from the pain. Unstuck from the agony. Unstuck from the shame. He came to get you unstuck from everything that embarrassed you, from everything that hurt you, from everything that offended you, from everything that made you resentful in the name of Jesus. 
I break that cord. I sever every tie in the name of Jesus. There I see uh, two angels. In the same way that there were two sentries, guards that were holding Peter, I see two angels with flaming swords cutting away the things that have held you bondage. Just coming. And I see him cutting through chains and ropes and bonds as though they are like spider webs to him. Cutting in the spirit, loosening you from the bands of wickedness, from the bonds of evil and perversion, loosing you from wicked desire in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I make no apologies about still being a deliverance preacher. I believe in the supernatural power of God coming to deliver his people. He delivers us from the prison of fear. He delivers us from torment. He delivers us from anger. Some of you have just been in such an angry place and it's locked you there. You're mad with somebody else trying to hold them down, but you don't realize that it holds you down with them. And he's saying, get up, get up, get up, get up. Once he sends his message to you, if you don't wake up, he will send something to slap you in a way where you cannot remain asleep any longer. And again, it is not to hurt you, it is to wake you. It is to sensitize you to the purposes of God. That he's in the process of something in your life. And I just pray in Jesus' name that every person, that every organization that is represented in this place, every family that is represented in this house, every family that is watching online, that the deliverance power of God would so flow to you even now, even now in the name of Jesus, and sever you from every chain, every fetter that binds, that the supernatural divine power of God will cause your bands to be loosed and doors that have been closed to you to open supernaturally. Doors of open communication, restoring relationship once again. God's opening doors. I see it in the realm of the Spirit. I hear chains falling off. In the Spirit, I hear them dropping, 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 falling, left and right, falling, so that He can bring you out. Get you up and bring you out. Get you up and bring you out. Get you up and bring you out. This is a new day. This is your wake-up day. This is your wake-up call. This is your coming out party today. To where you're coming out of every spirit of oppression, everything that has bottled you up and locked you down, this is your time now to come out of that thing. He's telling you, come on, be loosed from thine infirmity. Be loosed in the name of Jesus. Father, we look to you today. When we don't know what else to do, we look to you. Our eyes are upon you, Lord. We look to you today. Thank you for not leaving us in a God-forsaken condition. But thank you for looking upon our affliction, looking on our hurt, looking on our isolation, looking on our shame. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That every place that the blood go, goes and flows, that it heals, that it delivers that it causes a calm to come over us. I thank you in the name of Jesus for a peace that passes all understanding that guards our hearts and minds by Christ Jesus. Thank you, God, in the name of Jesus. We decree, decree and declare today for household salvation. Everything that came out of our bodies, everything that has been under our roof, God, we declare it in the name of Jesus. It belongs to you. Every son, every daughter, it belongs to you. Every relationship, God, may you redeem her. You are our kinsman, redeemer. We thank you, God, for paying the ransom 
to redeem our family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for redeeming our minds. Thank you for redeeming our bodies. You paid for it with the stripes on your own back. You purchased our healing. God, I thank you. I thank you today. Thank you for what you're doing in us. Thank you for what you're doing among us right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you help us to look beyond every distraction of the crowd and see Jesus. And the issue that we've had with our blood, folks that are blood related to us. God, I thank you now that you heal the issue of the blood. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Lord. In the name of Jesus. And as we take our steps, God, may it be a greater step toward victory, a greater step to the destiny that you're calling us to, a greater step to peace, God, in the name of Jesus. And may you cause heaven and all of the angels, God, to release their resources in the earth to cause about your holy and divine will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. May you release the heavens, God, to flow over, flow down into our lives today, into our businesses, into our bodies, into our minds, into our families, and everything over which you have given us authority and structure. And I pray, dear Lord Jesus, that as you deliver us out of situations that others thought that it was impossible, may we use that as our testimony part to say simply, but God, that there is no other explanation, but God, you brought us out. You brought us out. I thank you for every person and every family that you're bringing out today. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for bringing us out today. Thank you for bringing us out. Thank you, God, that because we believe that we shall see the glory, because we believe we'll see the glory, because we believe we shall see the glory, I thank you for the gift of faith falling on these people. Under the sound of my voice, I call in the gift of faith to supernaturally give them the faith to believe, God, to see the glory of God in what looks like an impossible situation. It's difficult, Lord, but it's not impossible. And I thank you that this day you seal your divine will and purpose for our life. And we give you all of the glory for what you have done, for what you are doing, and even for the greater part, God, of what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I hope that you were blessed today. Thank you for tuning in today. We'll see you next week. May God's incredible grace rest with you. Walk in the victory that he has given to you in Jesus' name. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.